especially in the major league world where, like you said, you play baseball every day, like sleep was probably the biggest thing as part of your recovery. If I didn't sleep well, I could feel it. Like, I'm just like, all right, I'm, this is going to be a tough day. <laughs> you know, then of course you load up on caffeine and that's it. down, <laughs> you're just going down, <laughs> you know, down the rabbit hole there. So what's up everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the cheeky Midweeky, where we are making strength and conditioning uh, not boring. And we have a former major league baseball pitcher on the show. He's also my cousin. I do not have the ability to throw a baseball like he does. It is a uh, cousin through marriage. So this is, I have no, none of the ability that he has, but uh, you're going to be able to learn a lot from him this episode. So Steve, Steve Ciszek, go ahead and introduce yourself to anybody that doesn't know who you are. Yeah. I uh, grew up in Falmouth, Massachusetts, you know, played basketball alongside this man right here. He was the four man. Mm -hmm. I was the two or three. I sat out on the perimeter. Every <laughs> shot I missed, he'd get the offensive board, throw it back out. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, we, you know, we grew up together. Um, you know, played high school ball here. Made my way to college at Carson Newman in Tennessee, and uh, got drafted in 2007 by the, the then uh, Florida Marlins. Now they're Miami Marlins. That's how old I am. And uh, yeah, played uh, parts of 13 seasons on eight different teams in the big leagues. So. It was a good, it's a fun ride. In my office, I have your, uh, the baseball bat from when you first got called up to the Marlins, you were number 66. Yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Talking about being old. I remember taking that trip, seeing you out there, um, first getting called up. Um, so thank you for coming on the show because you not only, you just finished playing, but you're also doing, um, you know, podcasting now and we were talking off air about that. But one of the first questions that I did want to ask you, because we have a big contingent of baseball strength coaches, is what have you seen the pros and cons without naming names? I'm not asking you to do that at all. But like, what have you seen has been the best strength and conditioning overall in your time? So that way our members can make sure they're doing a good job for their athletes. Yeah. Um, well, for me, it's the off season. Um, I was fortunate enough to train at Cressy Sports Performance. We actually just had him on yesterday on our podcast. He had a, a ton of um, advice and thoughts on, you know, training these elite uh, baseball players, specifically pitchers nowadays that throw. Everyone throws like ninety five plus. When I was in, when I first got called up, if you threw like ninety three to ninety five, that was considered gas. So that's like major league average <laughs> now. So, so with that, you know, there's a lot more injuries. So. The best I can say is, I mean, he just adapts. Eric does um, year in and year out. Um, he knew my body better than I did. So in the off season, I took it a upon myself, but you know, through his you know studies and what he thought I needed the most, I took it seriously to be able to um, push myself to endure a 162 uh, game season. I mean, it's six mm -hmm. months of actually longer than that with spring training of baseball mm -hmm. every day. So if you know, those guys that don't push themselves in the off season and have the correct, you know, training to help get their body moving the right way to prevent injury or give yourself the best possibility to prevent injury. Um, you know, that's, that's on them. So, uh, so in the off season there, and then I won't, without mentioning any teams, um, a re more recent team you can put together, <laughs> uh, they, they took account of our workload, um, especially as relief pitchers. And then, then you talk about, you know, when you wanted to train and stuff like that. And so relief pitchers are a lot different than starting pitchers. I'm sure we'll get into that later. But um, this, this one of the recent teams I played for had a great, um, you know, setup for that. And as you talk about the relief pitchers, one of my buddies, um, and he's, you know, he's our age too. His friend worked for one of your former teams, the uh, Cardinals. And he said that if somebody was – they threw X number of pitches as a relief pitcher. They would then, it was like, hey, today's a high day. They already hit what they had to do. They're not going to pitch the next day. They would go in and lift after they'd done throwing. Like, is that a realistic world? And if so, what did those lifts look like for our members that are like, hey, that's the world I'm living in. Like, I got to do a good job for these guys. Yeah, so you got to, I mean, it's across the board, right? So I was more... I'll just, uh, who cares if I name the teams? It's the, the Nationals last year were phenomenal with it, and the Angels are really good too. Um, and uh, if, like, let's say I threw two days in a row, my workload was through the loop. I was in the yellow to red category for being available the next day. Mm -hmm. um, I typically want to make sure I lift that night. Um, so everyone's different. We had one guy on the team that would lift almost every day and run like crazy and just 
like honestly wear himself out <laughs> it seemed like but he was a machine he's able to do eat like five thousand calories a day um but for me I don't, I don't think that's sustainable for that long of a year i love the work ethic but um i personally like to train after the game to give myself the most um to save every bullet you know per se for my outings so i wanted to be as fresh mm -hmm. as i could for the game and then just lift afterwards so i was used to lifting at 10 11 at night at times uh, other guys, other guys like to lift before the game to get their body going. Um, there's some, you know, scientific evidence I think that says it produces some testosterone or something like that, and you're naturally in your body to, to get it going. And uh, I, I didn't like it. I felt like my legs felt like jelly when I was, you know, trying to pitch in a game. I didn't want to do that. So everyone's different. And as a strength coach, I think you got to realize that. And at the professional level, um, it's hard to tell guys what they need to do every single day. A lot of guys come in mm. prepared. It's the ones that have no clue that just kind of float around and pitch or play off their God-given ability that hmm. you need to like to manage their workload more, get them in the gym and not be lazy or so, and so on and so forth. And believe it or not, there's people like that out there. How about when you were on the road though? Because you know that's all fine and dandy when you're at home, but if you're on the road, do you have the ability? Because we might have, like, with our college, um, we have a, a big amount of college baseball strength coaches, but we do have some professional ones And just on the show two weeks ago. Um, is it conducive to be able to do all of that on the road, too, just because you talk? I mean, 80 or 81 of the games are on the road all the time, right? Yeah, totally. Um, and every every place we go to on the road, the, they have a weight room on the, on the visiting side. Now it could be the size of a closet or it could be like immaculate. Like you just depends on where you play. So, but they are getting better. They've really emphasized that over the last five years because at times, like let's say you play in Wrigley field before they did the renovations mm -hmm. as a visitor, we'd walk over to the home side and lift in their tiny little weight room. They had, you know, like, again, it was small before they did all this old stadium. And it was so awkward. Like, let's say you, you won the game and you punched out, the dude that's standing next to you doing like squats it's just like hey man how's it going you know they don't want to see you in there so uh, major league baseball did you know and the players association they put together a plan to make sure there's a weight room on it on the visiting side as well so you can still get your work in no problem um but for me personally i had my own uh, regimen i like to do and i'd communicate it with the strength coaches they'd approve of it and i'd work lower body one day upper body the next day two to three days off depending on my workload do it all over again for the whole season because i never you never know as a relief pitcher when you're going to pitch so mm. i just wanted to make sure i get in there for for our strength coaches out there they're like okay that's that's fine and dandy how did they go about like how do you manage because i haven't done it how do you manage like actually being able to cycle all of the different exercises so like you said you're not just doing sos when you're playing all the time like how do you continue yeah. to adapt without it being just boring and monotonous oh it's boring and monotonous at times <laughs> let's be honest <laughs> um but i mean if you're driven to I mean, when you're in a season i'm not lifting to get stronger i'm lifting to maintain right mm -hmm. um the last thing I want to do is to like push myself after again, a, a heavy workload as a relief pitcher. I, you know, I, me personally, I threw quite a bit um, and then blow something out in the weight room. I'm just trying to maintain, you know, what I, what I did in the off season um, to, and carry that throughout the whole year. So I'm, I don't break down. And so as a reliever, I feel like that's kind of the, the protocol. Like you just lift to maintain a starter could get away with it a little bit more. They might, they'll throw one day and they have five days off before their next start, four or five days. And so they have a different regimen. You know, they'll take the first day off. They'll lift heavy maybe their second day of recovery. That uh, that same day, they also have a bullpen, like a touch field to work on their stuff. And then they have, you know, two or three more days off, you know, to do whatever they need to do. So they have a set schedule. Relievers are kind of all over the map. So, again, you just got to know your player and their role. Um, and so, yeah, it's it, it can be difficult. But strength coaches in the big leagues, they have, you know, nowadays especially – um, because strength and conditioning, strength training in general has gotten more specific to each pl uh, player. And mm -hmm. so it's just a lot better than it used to be. You know, guys are figuring it out. And you continue to talk about the off season and how important that is. Are you considering spring training part of the off season where you guys are starting to build it? Or it's like, hey, no, I'm talking the months, the months that we're away, whether it be November, December, January, before everybody starts to report, because you guys yeah. all used to report earlier too, right? 
Correct. So I'm talking about like, all right, the season's over. I, I take one to two weeks off from the weight room, ideally. Later on in my career, I took a little bit longer. I'm old man. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> one to two weeks off, and then I'm back in the weight room, um, and I'm pushing myself pretty hard for the next however months it is till spring training. When spring training hits, for me again, like I'm starting to – I'm still lifting heavy but slowly tapering back because now my workload's getting bigger. I'm throwing a bullpen every other day. And then uh, when games hit, I'm throwing, uh, you know, I'm trying to get my body acclimated. So I'm to, uh, you know, 162 game season and potentially pitching three out of uh, five days and or four out of seven. You know, those are, those are, that's a lot, you know, for a whole year. And so 100 percent. And if yeah. going back, you know, we're still staying within training a baseball player. But thinking back to when you first broke into the league and thinking back to college, I wasn't aware of just how often you guys are playing baseball all the time. Like you essentially yeah. have August off. That's it, right? Like in college, mm -hmm. like how do you handle that to make sure you don't wear out too? Because it sounds like, okay, cool. You're in the pros. You're playing for a while. Then you have time to get away. You have time to build your foundation of strength. But when you're just playing baseball all the time, like how do you make time to do that in college? Yeah. Oh, in college ball? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, like how does that, like the college strength coach, how do you handle that? Because we talked about the pros, but like now within mm -hmm. the college world, how do you handle that? I think college is a, a whole different animal because, I mean, you're not playing games in the fall, though. You're scrimmaging and practicing maybe, but true. Th that's, the, that's the time, or especially in the summer, um, where you you need to start getting stronger. And that's what I, I learned later on in my college career is, um, you know, in the summertime, I didn't lift as much because I was playing summer ball, and I wish I would have taken more time to train and get stronger. And um, and then, yeah, work on my craft, of course, but not play as many games. And um, I wish I took the summers a little bit more seriously in terms of you know building a better foundation. But in the fall, man, like our our college would it beat the daylights out of us. You know, we'd be in the weight room and running every day, pretty much. And um, for me, it was I've, it was eye opening. My freshman year, I was. I came in throwing like 84 tops and uh, all of a sudden you put some weight on me and, and, uh, you know, keep me, uh, and you know, me in high school, I was like a newborn deer runner. I was tall, <laughs> Nike, big knees. Well, now I'm doing agility work, lifting weights, like running my, like, you know, running my legs off. And I came in the next year I topped out at 95 oh, wow. uh, after my freshman year. And it's because I never lifted really in high school or pushed myself. The most running I did was with, you know, coach Lundberg in basketball. So <laughs> I was just so underdeveloped, man. And so I, that's where I, I think I hit my strides with that fall is when the team pushes you in the weight room and uh, with agility work and the strength and the conditioning aspect for sure. That's interesting to hear because, you know, I, I actually, I, until I got to Towson and I was around baseball and then my buddy, um, Justin, who was at Illinois, now he's down at college park, but he was, he was the guy that was running the baseball team. And I mean, they, got after it like they lifted heavy as heck and i yeah. started to do my research and it's like baseball teams like they they get after it it's not kind of this just uh at least in college where it wasn't this notion of like oh we're gonna do uh heavy bat swings or heavy baseball throws like they're they're lifting and getting after it yeah especially nowadays um they, i think um with a revolution of sports specific training and especially in baseball, like colleges have now hired, you know, strength and conditioning coaches that are familiar with that aspect and, and what the, you know, ball player goes through. And, and so more and more, I mean, I, I was at a D2 school, the D2 level, maybe not as much. Our head coach is also the strength coach typically, and, <laughs> but he does all his research. But I mean, you got to realize like he has one set program. He runs out to a position player and a set program runs out to his pitchers and just get after it. I'm sure that's how it goes. That's how it was when I was there. So, Nowadays at like the D1 level, like it's a lot more specific from what I'm gathering. And a lot of times when I'm training in the off season and college kids come in for like, let's say Christmas break, I mean, they have, they're super strong, man. I mean, they're outlifting a lot of the pro guys. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Um, and that attributes to, you know, the level of play they're at too. Everyone's throwing, like I said, 95 plus and hitting bombs left and right. So you actually just teed up my next question perfectly. Um, I wanted to talk about arm care because... I feel like there could be a misnomer of what is good and, and not good arm care for a baseball pitcher. And in the interest of keeping, you know, the athlete healthy and on the field, obviously that's very important for a pitcher and a strength coach to be able to understand it. 
So how difficult is it on the body? Like what, how the, the difference between that, you know, 95 and a hundred miles an hour, like how much more taxing is it really? Because to the lay person, I'm like, it's five miles an hour more. Like what's the big deal? But just talk about like how truly different that is. Yeah. I mean, you're just putting so much more stress on those ligaments. And if you don't have a good foundation, guess what? Like you're more liable to blow out. So you got nowadays, I don't know, 16 year olds that are throwing up, you know, low to mid nineties or above. And they're lanky little kids that have developed all this arm speed and arm strength, but they don't have the foundation to back it up. And so naturally they're not going to last long. Right. And, and very few do anyways. And so I think that's, you know, where the problem is, is yeah, we're building incredible arm strength, but you're not actually taking care of your arm, um, by lifting, uh, heavy with your lower body and doing this, you know, your shoulder work like you should, you know, you're just a young, naive kid. Now, if they're trained properly, they would. But again, if part of your arm care is, you know, your your total body care, like your your legs, your core, because I'll tell you what, Justin, when my, my hip was messed up in 2016. I remember that. I was you were the I Mariners, was, right? Yeah, I was struggling. I'm like, why is my shoulder killing me so much? Oh, yeah, because I don't have a lower half to throw throw off of anymore like i'm not using my lower half i'm just blowing out my shoulder you know trying to decelerate my arm and pitching day after day in high leverage situations it just i couldn't keep up so put that on a 15 year old's body that isn't strong enough to you know hold the force of throwing 95 miles an hour you know 16 year old whatever uh there's a good chance that they're gonna they're gonna be in trouble if if not then or when they're in their early 20s so mm. it'll catch up to them so again your proper arm care begins with you know how you're lifting you know especially with your lower half uh and your shoulder work and that's something that you know we focus on quite a bit and then yeah arm care is you got to listen to your arm too so rest is huge especially in the major league world where like you said you play baseball every day like sleep was probably the biggest thing as part of your recovery if i didn't sleep well i could feel it like i'm just like all right i'm this is gonna be a tough day <laughs> you know then of course you load up on caffeine and so down <laughs> you're just going down <laughs> you know down the rabbit hole there so yeah hopefully that answers your uh, question but no you did and you you started to tease the sleep because that's what uh, i'm going to come back to that one but okay. with the arm care there's more and more research out about ice whether to ice whether not to ice has that trickled its way into major league baseball because typically you always yeah. see a relief um a starter they got the ice on their shoulder right away like talk about that yeah so um nowadays guys don't really ice in fact i was like one of the few that still did because for whatever reason it works for me i know when i didn't ice i didn't feel great the next day and maybe it has a placebo effect i don't know so i just stuck with it right mm -hmm. um but nowadays, guys have kind of strayed away from it. If anything, um, especially position players will contrast. After the game, they're in the uh, cold tub, hot tub, cold tub, hot tub, and so on for you know whatever their regimen is. Everyone's different. Mm -hmm. um, so for it depends who you are, the, the player, I guess. Um, I'm not sure about the science, whether ice – I don't think it's been proven that ice actually helps or not. It might actually not help, but uh, – like yeah, I said, no, the science me. will say that it doesn't help. And that's why, like, yeah. that's why any of the nerds like me that read this stuff and we're like, oh my gosh, please stop. But like you said, I would never want to tell you, a, a major league vet that has been playing for so long, like, dude, I'm right, in. Apparently it works for you. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to mess with what works for you, but the research would say, but at the same time, research is always not perfect because people that have the best VO2 max don't always win the marathon. So it is incomplete. But as a nerd, I love hearing that, that like, Hey, this kind of a paradigm shift. Like that's, that's cool yeah. to hear. If I, I mean, if I were a coach and a young kid asked me, Oh, do I need to ice? I'm like, I'd probably say no, but I did. I mean, if you want to try it, go for it. But like, it's not going to kill you one way or another, but Correct. I, I, like I said, it was just one of my things. I just, kind of stuck with because I knew I had a pretty good feel of what I'd you know feel like the next day. But at the same time, you mentioned the fact that you, you did grow up in a different era though. Like you came up when strength and conditioning wasn't really the norm. Let it like for us at Falmouth high school, we didn't have, like they started to kind of evolve and you know, the weight room's getting better and better, but like yeah. the notion of a high school strength coach was never the thing back for us. Right. I mean, we're not that old. We're 36 and 37, but like, that, I think I, li that, yeah. Or you, actually, I mean, no. I, your birthday's coming up. You're not 37 yet. 
<laughs> tomorrow, dude. Tomorrow, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So thirty seven tomorrow. Way to rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> it's your Sean Alexander year. Sean Alexander. He's a heck of a running back. Yeah, he um is. So within the arm care stuff, you talked about sleep. How do you handle the sleep schedule when you're all over the place? Like you're not sleeping in a constant bed. Um, How do you handle that? Because we have a ton of uh, college strength coaches that travel not as much, but they have to deal with uh, school. So how do you help navigate the sleep world for baseball? It's it's really hard because um, especially I would say at the minor league level, the big league level, they try to cater to you is to get you as comfortable you know with the best of their ability minor league level and like triple a especially like you're getting up at four or five in the morning to go on get on hop on a flight to fly to the next city and then probably play that day yeah uh, so it's tough um so i didn't know how serious it was until about 2016 we had a sleep um coach come in with the mariners in spring training because we traveled more than any team in the big leagues from you know obviously seattle northwestern mm-hmm. most part of the country other than alaska and so i was like man like i didn't realize like what this is actually doing in my body so um naps were huge for me and a lot of teams have now installed nap rooms which to the lay person Ooh, nice. sounds re- ridiculous but it's actually super helpful like guys would hit bp let's say we're at home and there was like a three bedroom completely blacked out with a sound machine. You can, if you're struggling, you go in there and take a quick nap. And for a lot of guys, um, it became their, their routine and they'd power nap, wake up, feel like they could run through a wall. Some, some one guy called the nappuccino where you power a coffee yeah. down and take a 20 minute nap and wake up and bam. So, um, those were great, uh, little tools to help, you know, recover. But ultimately, um, you know, when you get out of a game, let's say it's at home, could be 11 o'clock at night, you know, you're going home trying to wind down, but you're all hopped up from the game or on the caffeine you drank for me in like mm-hmm. the ninth or seventh inning, sixth inning. <laughs> it's, it's hard. So melatonin and trying to create like, and trying to go into bed at the same time was crucial for me. Um, and if I slept poorly, my wife was awesome. She let me take a nap before going to the field the next day and, um, and take care of the kids. So, you got to have a good wife as part of the, <laughs> the nap routine. So. Amen to that. Shout out to Marissa if you're listening to this later on. Um, yeah. That's – honestly, hearing you say that puts it all in that much more perspective because you don't think about that. And you also don't think about the fact of like, okay, if it was a home game or if you're on the road, some of the times that I'd come and visit you or other people, you want to try to go see those people too. So you have to balance that aspect of it with like, shoot, we're playing tomorrow and i got to be able to like – I, I, yeah. I might be, get called, um, you know, my, my number called and I have to go pitch again, right? Yeah. I mean, it, no, it's so true. But, like, it, to put it in perspective, like Madden, Joe Madden, was, he understood that pretty well. So there's one time, I think we had, like, a couple of rain delays and we got in super late to Pittsburgh. Um, so we had rain delays the night before. We played until, like, midnight, you know, got to Pittsburgh, mm. got to bed, like, I don't know, 3 or 4 in the morning. And then woke up and had to play that day, and we slaughtered the, them. And I was talking to him like, "Man, you thought the guys would come out like dragon?" He's like, "No, wait till tomorrow. Like it's the next day that hits." And sure enough, boom! Like we were just so sluggish. Like you know, you're on your <laughs> high from only sleeping three or four hours and then playing a major league game, and all of a sudden, like your body's like, "No, slow down, man. That sleep bank is is empty still. We got to recover." So, yeah. That's unbelievable. Um, you mentioned Joe and. I read the book, The Cubs Way. Did you guys still do the uh, the Little League week where, like, you guys just showed up to the ballpark? Or are you not allowed to talk about that? And I understand if you're yeah, not. Yeah, no, we did. We uh, – oh, you're talking about Legion week where we'd show up, like, they'd close the doors down until 4. Yeah, like, you weren't allowed to show up early. Yeah. Like, it was just, like, show up and play the game and go home, right? Yeah, we call it Legion Baseball Week, so – to, he'd like to pay homage to like his local legion team where he played i think but yeah they close the doors unless you needed like a rehab guy uh-huh. and you weren't allowed to show up to the field for a seven o'clock game until like four or five and that was so hard for me like like a lot, something like, like i wanted to go in and watch video and do all that stuff but it was awesome it was one week of that and the guys we played we always played well during that week it was impressive it was you know pretty impressive um, when you talked about the video that made me think about the arm care stuff, how important was it for you to know who you'd be pitching against to then, all right, I'm playing against somebody that they can't handle X pitch. So, you know, maybe you're going to throw more of X pitch. Does that affect what you do in the weight room after or before, uh, uh an outing? 
taking a quick break from the show, everybody. Promise this will take less than 15 seconds. Friendly reminder, go ahead, hit that subscribe button below. It helps us out and it helps you out by being notified whenever we have new content come out. So hit that subscribe button. And with this, let's get back to the show. No, it doesn't um, affect me in the weight room. Like I said, I stuck to a pretty strict uh, routine. Um, but I, one thing I did leave out that I think is extremely important in arm care is soft tissue work. So I, I mean, four to five times a week, I was in there getting my shoulder or elbow, uh, or neck worked on, um, you know, massaged out, you know, soft tissue work and you know, even a chiropractic adjustment. We had a really good Cairo and, uh, with the Nats. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that is crucial for recovery i feel like um and just really just pumping that fluid out um and because my elbow would just if i pitched a ton it would just get so tight um mm -hmm. and there, there's other modalities we would use that like a uh, um uh what's it called i'm drawing a blank right now um mark pro machine those were popular um the uh there's i, I like this one it's, it's called a PIMF machine, PMF, -F, I think, or something like that, where it's like electromagnetic. Um, it just like start, it just start like making this clicking noise and it would find the problem areas and hurt like no other. Hurt and then so all good. of a sudden start, yeah, exactly. Start going away. Like there's, there's between having a training staff that knew what they were doing and were competent, which most teams now do have, um, to the modalities that they give you to try out, um, that is huge for recovery in your arm care. Yeah. How important is grip strength for throwing a baseball? I didn't think it was important until recently. You know, they, they check grip strength quite a bit. and Okay. Um, I think especially depending on who you are, but guys like to spin the ball. Um, uh, I, I had more layback in my wrist and everything like that. My grip strength was probably average. But I feel like guys with like the stronger forearms are able to you know spin the ball a, a lot more. Uh, I've noticed anyways. So, and, th and then with grip strength, you know, it helps with your ulnar, you know, your UCL. So guys mm -hmm. typically w would have, you know, started working on a lot more forearm strength and stuff like that. So that became, that's become a lot more popular over the years. And then I don't think any of our, um, submarine throwing the way that you throw, you know, that cross between fully submarine and sidearm, like your delivery being awkward. Um, according to traditional standards, does that change how you have to do your arm care too for any of our uh, coaches out there that maybe have somebody that throws similar to you? Um, uh, yes and no. I mean, when I, I know in the off season when I'm training, if we're doing like uh, manuals, if I'm using a coach like let's say Eric, I'd put I'd put my arm in my arm, arm slot and you know, need to do the, you know, what do you call it, perturbation or you're knocking your arm around mm -hmm. trying to you know stabilize your shoulder. Um, Yep. I'd keep that at my arm slot. That's something we would do for sure. But I don't think it really makes a difference or another. You know, because I was just trying to think of like, uh, I know it's not the exact same delivery, but softball pitchers can obviously do more and blah, blah, blah. So it's like, hey, if, if you're changing the angle of it, you're not always just straight up over the top. Does it put less stress on the shoulder? But maybe that is why your elbow was bothering you more. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, it doesn't hurt to, to do a lot of your work at, at that arm angle. But the thing is for me, like, Guys that typically throw sidearm, they don't naturally throw sidearm. Like they throw over the top, they get warm, and then they all drop down and work on their craft. For me, like I don't know any other way. This is my arm slot. Like I don't know how okay. to throw from up here. I don't know how to throw from here. I just this is it. This is all I got. <laughs> and people don't understand. Like, well, when did you drop down? I'm like, for as long as I remember, I've had a low arm slot. It's just gotten naturally lower over the years, and so that's kind of why we did what we would do uh, from okay. our arm slot. Yeah. Cause that, that was going to be my question. Like, did you also for, for your arm care, would you then advise people, you know, during warm up long toss, like, Hey, we're going to go straight up over the top and then work down to the angle. But you kind of answered that question already. I would advise not to do that though, because maybe like if you're just flipping the ball and get loose, but if you're going to work on, if you, this is where you want your arm slot to be during a game, I'm, th I want to throw from this arm slot and, and master it. Right. Because in a throwing, this is important, in a throwing program, you throw way more playing catch with your throwing partner than you will off a mound. And so anytime you, mm. anytime you start you know, deviating from your arm slot or anything like that, it's going to create bad habits. You want to reinforce good habits. You know, I'm not going to, if I'm a, a golfer, I'm not going to, and I have a hitch in my swing and I practice hitting with that same hitch instead of having a coach to like help clean it up and teach me how to, you know, swing properly. It's just going to 
compound you know that bad habit i want to make sure that everything i'm doing is i'm creating good habits so throwing program is the same thing it's super important that every throw we make has some intention behind it that's a heck of a point um my next series of questions is kind of about the mindset of how to be a professional athlete whether it, it performing under performing under pressure like getting out there getting called in in these high pressure situations because whether it's in the professionals or in college baseball like there's a ton of eyes on you and everybody's watching you throw that ball like what mm -hmm. is that like again it goes back to preparation <laughs> so how you prepare before going into the outing is going to matter big time because the game will speed up on you now and and nowadays justin i didn't have to deal with this but there's a pitch clock so oh yeah now yeah, it's yeah. really flying um which we can go into a whole bunch more detail yeah but um <clears throat> so yeah so how do you slow the game down when the game is forever speeding up especially in um you know heavy situations so for me like i i'd visualize a lot in the bullpen when it's the fifth inning on i didn't like to sit down i like to stand uh, for the rest of the game mm -hmm. uh, just to keep my mind sharp and, and not be lazy like lazy minded and I see my slot in the lineup where I could probably go in the game and I visualize facing those hitters and the outcome and where, how I want to pitch them specifically. I know the scouting report and I'm going through that in my mind and watching myself do it. And then when it comes to game time, you know, if it starts getting hairy, I'm able to take a deep breath and remember the plan and get back after it and let it happen. So it all starts with your preparation and that takes a lot of the weight off the actual performance part of it because um, you know you put in the work. You knocked that one out of the park. Uh, what's okay? What's the difference between though? You know, you're on the home, home and on the road, and, and again, you're just you're there, and you're the one throwing it. And is it you're just like yeah, you know, you you do it for a while. You've been doing it for twelve years. So like you just kind of you tune it out. Is that honestly just how you do it? <laughs> I thought it got harder as I got older, honestly, because I'm young and I'm, I'm more fresh. My arm, the ball's jumping out of my hand. Older, I'm like, oh man, I don't know where this thing's going. I can't feel the ball in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, seriously, it's like on the road, it's a good question because you go into a stadium that's packed full and it's hostile, like me being, I, I kind of like that better because at the end of the day, my goal is to shut those fans up, you know? Yeah. Um, and if I do that, it means we win the ball game. So there's nothing like, I don't know, like when I'm in San Francisco, it feels like the entire stadium's on top of you and it's loud. And then all of a sudden you make that last pitch and get that last out and you can hear a pin drop and yeah. it's just you and your boys like high-fiving each other at the end of the game. You're like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> we did it. Uh, and it's, it's not so much a pride thing as in like I shut the fans up, but it's more like, you know, the boys put together a win today on the road in a hostile environment. Like that's, that, that's big time. So, you know, there's a lot of reward with that. No, that is. And getting to slowing the game down with this pitch clock, there has been, people have been asking me about it. Um, and I want to know your opinion about it. How to slow the game with a pitch clock. Oh, man. Or like, yeah, and, and just even the pitch, like the pitch clock, like you're, you're somebody that does it. So you have way better skin in the game. Your opinion matters more than mine as just the nerdy strength coach. Like <laughs> talk about it to anybody that is dealing with it as a strength coach. Yeah, I mean, it's, there's definitely a huge adjustment. And that's what I've been like wanting to see this year with the pitchers, how they're dealing with it. Because uh, guys, a lot of the, you're taught from, well, I guess high school now, but for me in college on to slow the game down, you want to work quick, but slow the game down. And that's hard to do. And it takes some practice. So I think, first of all, this is not gonna be, it's gonna sound ridiculous, but you just got to go through it at first. And the best way to go through it is when you have failure. All right, what, what can I do now to be able to slow this down? My heart was racing. I was nervous. I had a throw because the pitch clock was up. Like there's gotta be some sort of adjustment. <clears throat> and for me, when I was pitching before the pitch clock, I liked to work fast. So when I got into some trouble, uh, my tendency was just work quicker and get, and, you know, get through it. Uh, but when I was at my best, I was able to step, I'd step off for a second. I'd pick a stadium number out on the top of the stadium, section 324, let's say at a random stadium, right? So just look at it for a second and then clear my mind and get back on the mound and go. Like I just trying to pick something else up that would grab my attention away from the game for a moment and then get back after it and go back to my plan of attacking. So can you do that with a pitch clock? I think you still can. Like I didn't, I didn't like, some guys would step off and, look around, take a deep breath, you know, take a couple seconds and get back on. You don't have that luxury anymore. Like 
you got to make a, some sort of adjustment. And for me, it was to just take that second to step off, pick something else, pick something out in the stadium just to clear my mind and reset and then get back after it and go back to the plan I had. Yeah, like now can you – you don't have the ability to do that now, correct? I, I, I think you can. Um but it's just got to be, it's got to be quicker, right? Like uh, I'm not going to sit yeah. there and contemplate life. Like I, you know, like you typically could <laughs> here's grinding out there. Like, what am I doing, man? Like you don't have that luxury. <laughs> like, no, I think two things. One, I still think you can get away with that is trusting your process pitch to pitch and worrying about pitch to pitch and not what the like current situation is. And then two, I, I don't know why pitching coaches don't go out more often. You get, X amount of visits a game. Like, why not just get to the zero count pretty much save your mound visits for later in the game when things start to get hairy to slow the guy down a little bit. You know, a lot of teams end up with, you know, two, three, four mound visits left at the end of the game. It just, for me, I think the coaches just need to get out there. But then with that, you got to know your player. Some guys like to work quick and get through it. Other guys like to take their time. You got to know which guy it is. You know, if the guy that likes to take his time, run out there get out there and give him a breather just the other guy let him ride you know <laughs> whatever the so. way that i looked at it in terms of how i would try to prepare like okay steve you're going to be working with me and we're getting you ready for um you know this abbreviated clock it's like let's work some of the pitching days or portions of your pitching it's like you're going to work just every pitch has to be within that time frame like yeah you, you got to get the ball off and just to to work those game demands then we could work some where we're going to, instead of it being just like the 20 second, we're going to go and now we're going to throw it 30 seconds. So now you've got more time. Maybe we can get some more velo on it. But then other times it's almost going to be like, you know, conditioning for your arm where, hey, it's 10 seconds. You're not even worried about getting that exact ball back. Like you throw it, we'll give you a new ball. Boom. Does that make any sense to you? Would you be like, okay, cool. I see what you're doing here. Or would you be like, dude, this is too quick for a 10 second? So no, no, that's that's great. We uh, we actually talked about that yesterday. Um, is how to prepare guys for that speed. So at, I know at Cressy's place, a lot of bullpen guys, you know, especially nowadays, you you're, you throw a pitch, you look at the computer, and the pitching coach is like, yeah, you had you know such and such RPMs. You're looking at the tilt of all that. Obviously, you don't have that luxury in a game. So it's like, how do you find mm -hmm. that happy medium? And t I think you're right there's got to be some sessions where it's just like it's go time and you, this is what it's going to be like in a game. And there's other times where you're trying to refine your craft. Yeah. Like, you know, take a couple of bullpens to, to look at the, the numbers on that. But I want to, I want to see guys throw a bullpen, I don't know, 10 to 15 seconds in between pitches and then look at the numbers yeah. afterwards and see how they compare to when you took your time and then make adjustments accordingly. Um, because you're right. It, it, the workload actually increases because you're having less time to, uh, you know, take your time maybe in between in between pitches and there's more stress in between pitches now. So what that does to the body, it's, you know, you need to work up to that. A hundred percent. Cause it's like, Hey, let's work above the demands in terms of you can throw it a little bit harder. You got more risk or, or you have more rest. You can do the things that you talk about, like take your breath, do what you got to do. You know, you're not going to be able to do that in a game. However, you can prepare your arm for those higher velocities, but then essentially looking at it as, conditioning for your arm maybe you only yep. throw 20 pitches 30 pitches um with a 10 second break because it's like okay it was a, a longer outing you had to throw 30 pitches but now you're conditioning your arm excuse me for that shorter amount of time so that way yep. when you do maybe get in a situation if you throw 30 pitches and ideally there's no one on base so you still get you get 20 seconds on base or 15 seconds which how does it work now I, I think it's 19 seconds. I might be 19. totally wrong on that, but I know I know you can only step off or pick over twice, and the third time it's like the runner can just go. You can't even you can time oh it. What? Yeah, it's, that's that's the worst part of the rule, in my opinion, because I don't mind the pitch clock, but yeah, it's it's brutal. Wow. Yeah. That okay. Now that really does change things with the uh, with that ability for. I didn't even think about the base runners that are trying to steal the pit. Ah. So wow. Well, with, let's go back to the um, bullpen session. So I like what you said. Let's say, um, all right, with this particular athlete, um, we're going to pitch to the pitch clock. You know, this is the amount of time you get in between pitches. Let's say it's – let's just go with 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, not every bullpen is going to be sharp. Guys get – you'd be surprised. Guys start, like, 
cussing themselves out in the bullpen. Really? They get frustrated. Oh yeah, they're they're competitive. They want they want to be sharp every single time. It's like the perfectionist that makes pitchers. Sense, yeah. So, but you can use that to your advantage, right? Like, all right, your bullpen's not going great. Your outings aren't going to be that great either at times. How, what are you going to do in this bullpen um, session to? to clean it up and start, you know, pumping strikes again, you know, that's going to translate to what you do out there in the game. That's how you prepared for that situation too. So I think again, bullpen sessions are going to be even more important nowadays than ever before. Now, speaking of bullpen sessions for you as a middle reliever that might do one, two, three innings, did you throw that way in your bullpen sessions where it would be 20 to 30 pitches, sit down for a while and then repeat that? Yeah. Um, I never really sat down and repeat like pitched another inning. I kind of did that um, maybe in like a live um, batting practice session where I'd face hitters. But I mean, it's just like any building up any chronic workload, right? You start lower. Like I'd always start at 15 pitches, nothing but fastballs for my first two. If my arm felt good, the next week I'm bumping it up to 20, 25 pitches. Then if I feel good after that, I'm doing 30 pitches and mixing in all three. You know, so fastball, slider change up if i once i build that workload up and i feel strong then you can increase or increase the intensity um or then at that point start facing hitters which actually automatically you know spurs up some um some more uh, aggressiveness in you and so more torque on your elbow and shoulder and body um that just comes naturally when you face somebody and you want to strike them out so um, again you're just building up that workload slowly but surely and that starts typically in december for me guys have started earlier nowadays um and then uh that works up until spring training to where like i said you're throwing every other day off the mound yeah and uh, for the for the strength coaches out there that are trying to get there you know say they're dealing with somebody coming back from an injury like you did with your hip um what is the most important thing that you would advise to a strength coach that is working with somebody returning from it, whether a shoulder or a hip, like what's the best thing that they could do for that athlete. And then what's the worst thing. And if it's more than one on each, but like what would be the hundred percent do's hundred percent don't. I think you, oh man, it's tough. Cause a, you have to know the athlete and their personality. Right. Um, so if you have a guy that wants to push it and you got to slow him down or a guy that's just like scared of a fly is going to land on his elbow after the surgery and it's going to blow out. <laughs> you know, you got to push him. Yeah. Um, and so at the end of the day, you just got to listen to your athlete, I think, because everyone's so different. And I've seen guys that, like I said, are scared to death. Like, oh, I felt this in my elbow. It's happening again. And the strength coach or trainer's like, dude, everyone goes through it. Like, you got to be able to push through it. If it's still barking after a week or two, like, we will, you know, we'll review it. But for now, let's continue with the soft tissue. Let's keep going and just reassure that guy. And then the other dude's like, man, I feel great. Like, I want, I'm ready to pitch in the game tomorrow. I'm like, dude, slow down. Like, no, we got to stick to the program. <laughs> At the end of the day, is sticking to what your protocol is, what your program is for that guy. Listening to them, but, you know, whether it's slowing them down or speeding them up or just keeping them comfortable. Like, because, you know, the guys want to be back out there on the mound. They're losing their mind in rehab. Like, it's just boring and it's tedious. But at the end of the day, it's important and they need to do it. And so you're their psych. You're their strength coach. You're everything. You're their dad. <laughs> like, you're just going to have to go through it with them. So, you know, be be patient, I think, is the biggest thing. And know your athlete. Amen to that, though, because there are a bunch of times, like, trying to figure out – that that is the hard line too though because it's like okay at what point it are they being 100 percent honest and you do have to take them at face value like okay you know maybe maybe it is bothering them like balancing that fine line of just never wanting to see your athletes be hurt is it's very difficult for a strength coach full i mean full disclosure like you want to you you carry all of the injuries like oh man i can't believe i got i, I let stevie have a a hip and like but then when you're punching people out, it's like, man, look at all the work he did. Like you never, you never take it. So it's, it, it's definitely difficult to, to deal with for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think the hardest part for strength coaches is you have that one guy and it's like, this dude's always complaining about something. He's Debbie downer all the time. Like I have to deal with this guy every day. And so it's difficult, right? Like, I, I, you know, I, I feel for a lot of <laughs> strength coaches and trainers because I, I know some of the people that I've played with are kind of like that. So it's like, I just gotta, I just gotta just be here for that guy, and you know, put my just be selfless about it. 
one of the other areas that we haven't talked about that I'm sure um, our strength coaches are curious about is nutrition. Like, how do you go about fueling yourself during an intermittent game where there is starts and stops? So within a game and then also within the, the longness of a season and then um, spring training. Yeah. Man, I'm probably – Every nutritionist cringes at my program, though. Really? <laughs> well, I have a, there's a method to my madness, but I mean, I didn't eat terrible during the year. I wasn't the healthiest of eaters, but I didn't eat like awful. Um, the off season, I'd give myself like a week or two to just crush everything. I'd go to Dairy Queen, just smash for like a week or two, and then get back on track somewhat. So maybe not so much the latter part of my career, but um, for the most part, I was pretty on top of it. Um, but when I say like nutritionist, I cringe a little bit. I'd eat a, I was a big peanut butter and jelly sandwich pregame every day. And it wasn't superstition. And I'll tell you why it was PB and J with yogurt and granola and fruit every day, um, before a game and every now and then I'd mix it up, but it's because there's no worse feeling dude than, uh, it's the fifth inning. You could pitch all of a sudden it hits and you got to take a dump. <laughs> it's like, you have to run in there and, and then all of a sudden you hear the game going and it's like uh-oh they might call down it might call down and then the phone rings and they're like steve you got to get ready and you're mid uh, on the toilet it is like every bullpen a reliever's worst nightmare <laughs> like worse than going to the bathroom in high school so like and the, for me i knew if i ate that like my stomach would be fine every time instead of eating like chicken thighs that possibly could have been undercooked and not, nothing good. Our chefs were awesome. But every now and then I, you know, as you see guys eat something and they're, they're not feeling it and that's not agreeing with them. I knew that what I ate was going to agree with me every day. It might not have been the super healthiest thing, but I felt good afterwards. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to roll with it. So that makes <laughs> yeah. perfect that sense. Yeah. That like, <laughs> yeah. But... Well, post game I'd eat whatever. And, it was, but I'd, I have like, I'd, I'd focus on eating good calories to help with the, re, the recovery po portion of, um, so I could bounce back, you know, better next day and feel better and, you know, fuel my muscles and everything, my body with good food. How different is it on the home, home and on the road? Like, are they, are you trying to do the exact same thing, whether it's home or away? Depends where you're at. I mean, really? Yeah. Uh, for the most part, the home places always have a good chef. Like, man, the Nats chef, chef was amazing. Um, you know, Angels was pretty good. Uh, I mean, pretty much the Cubs was incredible. They're the they're like probably the best. But the um, when you go on the road, man, it's like it's better now. The last three to five years than it was prior. I mean, it would be like chicken tenders and stuff mm -hmm. on the road, and and you go to places that just serve nasty food. And we had to complain one time in, in uh, Oakland because th the food was sitting under the light like burner for hours before we got to eat it and everyone got sick like we were just grinding <laughs> that was in 2021 so like it just depends where you're at you know so it's gotta roll with it that's uh that's unbelievable stevie i appreciate your time today our uh strength and conditioning coaches that work with baseball they're gonna get a ton out of this um anybody that's made it this far thank you and you also have uh, we talked about your podcast so go ahead and drop any information so they can follow you more yeah, we, we're like six episodes deep on uh, what's it's called Called to the Pen. It's me and my former teammate, Brandon Kinsler, um, just sharing some stories we had when we were with the Cubs and just over our playing careers and trying to have some guests on. So we're six episodes deep. We just share some of the mindset in baseball and, you know, try to interview some players and see how what makes them tick. And uh, we've had Sean Kelly on and uh, yesterday, Eric Cressy, that episode just came out, uh, who's a strength coach and really well known in the baseball arena. So, yeah, check it out if you have time. It's It's been a lot of fun. We'll, uh, we're going to add it to the show notes here. So appreciate you very much, cuz. Have a good rest of the day back in the good old state of Massachusetts on Cape Cod. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me on. You're welcome, man. Congratulations on making it to the end of the video. Why don't you celebrate by watching more videos just like it? You can also help us on our quest to placate the algorithm gods by liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting. Thank you.